Welcome to Yogi Views, where my guest is yoga itself, through interviewing those who practice it, teach it, sell it, or simply love it. I am Antonio Sousis. Yoga owes its amazing modern popularity to the work and dedication of gurus and masters that came from India. Few of them were more influential than Paramahansa Yogananda, who introduced many Westerners to the teachings of meditation and Kriya Yoga. His name means bliss, Ananda, through divine union, Yoga, and his hope was for a united world that would combine the best qualities of efficient America and spiritual India, in his own words. His book, Autobiography of a Yogi, is a perennial bestseller that has been in continuous publication since it first appeared in 1946 and is widely regarded as a modern spiritual classic. The organization he founded, Self-Realization Fellowship, Yogoda Satsang Society in India, is a worldwide non-profit organization with more than 600 temples, retreats, ashrams, and meditation centers around the world, offering all interested seekers the opportunity to come together to experience the power of group meditation, focused retreat programs, inspirational services, and to share in spiritual fellowship. To speak about this great guru and the organization he founded, I invited today Brother Kalyanananda and Brahmachari Martin. Welcome. Brother Kalyan Ananda is a member of the Self-Realization Fellowship monastic community since 1983 and has been inspiring audiences for many years throughout North America and South America, Asia and Europe with his insightful and engaging presentations. He was born in former West Germany and served as the senior minister at the Berkeley Temple of Self-Realization Fellowship in Northern California since 2000. 11. Brahmachari Martin is a member of the Self-Realization Fellowship monastic community since 1977 and was born and raised in Southern California. He currently lives and serves at the Self-Realization Fellowship Lake Shrine Temple in Pacific Palisades, California, and traveled throughout the United States, Canada, and Europe as part of SRF's public lecture tour series. Thank you very much for coming uh, here today. And uh, first of all, I would like to ask you a question that is of uh, most interest uh, of our viewers, which is, what was your first personal experience with yoga in general? Actually, my first experience was when I was a child and I didn't know what it was. I used to wake up in the middle of the night because I had a dream where I was in a beautiful blue sphere, no consciousness of the body. There was a white star that drew me magnetically in a tremendous peace. And I had that again and again. And I talked to my mom about it, and she just brushed this aside. And later on, then when I was in medical school, one of the other students she was just so much more mature and so much more together and understanding than I was. We were the same age, we were actually born the same months. That I asked her one day, what are you actually doing? And she said, oh, I'm practicing Kriya Yoga. And I said, what? And then she gave me the autobiography Yogi. And reading that book, that's where I understood all of a sudden what my dream was as a child. And then I started to get involved with uh, the teachings, became a member, started to meditate. And why did my first meditation? When I practiced one of our techniques, is what we call the Hon Sok technique of concentration, I was in that same uh, spiritual, beautiful, peaceful inner calmness that I'd always enjoyed as a child. And there I was. Wow. And since then, I they have know. never been looking back for me. And I could actually, I would not know how my life would be today without yoga, mm. without the practice of meditation. What about you? Well, when I was a teenager, I always had, I had just had this 
thought, this voice in my head that said, I should, you should meditate. You should learn to meditate. You should learn to meditate. And I just kind of didn't pay any attention until I was 18, 19, 20. Then I went to USC. And finally I thought, okay, let's do this. And so I just researched everything. And I read all the books about yoga and, you know, which is the best path. And I came to the conclusion that Raja Yoga was the best path for an American, busy American, because it was most balanced and it really incorporated meditation the way I thought it should be. So I got the Yellow Pages, <laughs> looked up Raja Yoga in the Yellow Pages, back when they had Yellow Pages, and uh, it was Hollywood Temple, because I was in Southern California, uh, Self-Realization Fellowship. And I went there and immediately they had a little meditation and similar to Brother Kalyananda, I felt this peace and I felt I'm home, this is what, this is what I want to do. And uh, I've been there ever since. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, this is the way you also got introduced to Yogananda, because I understand in, in your case, because of the book, of course, Yogananda mm -hmm. wrote that book. So, uh, or, or actually the question is, uh, because one of the beautiful things about uh, the way you represent yoga, which is not necessarily common in the United States, is through having a guru, so, through, through finding a master. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, how, how, did you, how did you feel that Yogananda was your master or your guru, if that is the case? Actually, I would say it's the other way around. The guru really knows his disciples and he is the one who draws the disciples to himself when he sees that the desire of uh, the disciple to know God is there. And so, when I saw his picture, the uh, what we call the standard pose that is on the autobiography of a yogi. Actually, that picture was taken here in San Francisco in 1924. When I saw that picture, there was instant recognition. I knew this is what I want to do for my life. And I was still in medical school and I was all geared to become a surgeon. But I knew at that moment, no, I'm going to switch. And uh, there is more important things than being a doctor. And so that's how it happened to me. And Instantly you actually left medical school? No, I didn't because uh, I had to uh, be sure what to go on. And so the first thing was I went to India and visited some of the uh, centers there because I had heard that uh, in 1977 they had the first convocation there which is a gathering of uh, members from all of uh, India and some of the surrounding countries like uh, Burma, Thailand and so forth. And I went there and uh, our current president at that time, Minalini Mata, she was the vice president at, in those days. Uh, I had an interview with, course, with her because exactly what you say, I wanted to leave medical school and right enter the ashram. And she said, no, no, no. It's one of the principles of Yogananda. What you have started, you have to finish. And so she said, you go back to Germany, you finish medical school, and then you can apply, not here in India, but you go and apply in America. That's where we want you to come. And so that's happened. I went, finished medical school, finished my uh, PhD, went to the military service, which in those days, in the early 80s, was still compulsory. Then right out of the Navy, I went into the ashram in Encinitas. <laughs> a bit of a cultural shock. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I bet. it was a great training. It was really, uh -huh. it was good because I knew through all the experience and having been a resident surgeon for three years, I exactly knew uh, what I would give up and what I would gain. So, and I've never looked back. Mm -hmm. So it was actually a great blessing for me. And in your case? Well, in my case, like I was saying, I was fixated on meditation and I always wanted to find a path to meditation. And Raja Yoga was the path I wanted. I found it in self-realization. But I noticed they were all talking about the guru. The guru is the greatest, the guru is this, the guru is that. And I said, fine, I'm in a meditation, you know. It didn't, I didn't have any problems with it either way. I read Autobiography of Yoga, incredibly impressed with Yogananda. And I did felt, feel something. But it was in meditation through the years that I developed this sense of Yogananda inside me and what that was, what that guru-disciple relationship was. And that's sort of how it, it blossomed with me after, through meditation, through 
years of meditation. But it was kind of funny because this was in the 70s, the 60s when everybody was going to India and everything. And all my friends, they went to India in the 60s looking for a guru. They came back. I had a guru and they didn't. <laughs> so it's like, it comes to you, you know, you don't have to seek it. Uh -huh. not, you know. uh -huh. Now, in general terms, um, because as I, I was expressing before, this is not the way yoga in general is practiced in the United States. People go to the gym, go to a studio, and also we live in a moment um, where people don't necessarily like to be told what to do or to have that kind of, of guidance. Um, what is in your uh, opinion, the importance of having a guru in terms of practicing yoga. Why is it important to have a guru or to be in a relationship with a guru? It's like you go, to a, you go to college, you learn from a professor, you go to a job, you learn from a mentor, your boss, or whatever. That's basically what it is. The guru, he knows the spiritual realm. He can help you, he teaches you, he shows you how to meditate. And basically that's, that's it. You're not surrendering your will to anyone. Mm -hmm. You're following his guidance in something that's kind of difficult and subtle. So it's, it, it's very helpful and very important to, to follow the teaching of someone who, who knows. And perhaps what you're saying is that it's, a, it's the spiritual path, because my next question would be then why is not the teacher at the local gym a guru for a person? Yeah, you, in order to really guide someone, you have to have have that depth. Mm -hmm. You have had to, in yoga, we go into the spine, and you go up the spine and the centers up to the brain. And these are, these are deep spiritual centers, and there are not a lot of, of yogis that have done that, that can go up there and come back and tell and say, this is the way it is, I can show you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, Yogananda as a guru is of course one of the most revered gurus uh, in the history of yoga and definitely tremendously influential in, in, in how popular yoga is today. What would you say are some of the core teachings of Yogananda? First of all, there is a unity of all religions. Because there is the exoteric part of religion, that's the dogma, that's grown in different centuries when the different founders of the religion lived, whether it's Islam, whether it's Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity. They were all, uh, to a certain degree, influenced by the time uh, the founder was living. But then there is the inner religion which is really the same for uh, all religions, and that's the esoteric part. Mm -hmm. That is the taking your consciousness inside, because Christ said, uh, or let's say in the Bible it says, be still and know mm -hmm. that I am God, and that's the Old Testament. So that goes back into the Jewish tradition. The problem only is that nobody told us how to go inside. Buddhism says the same. God is inside. Islam says the same. Seek the Lord thy God within yourself. But nobody tells us. Mm -hmm. But that's where yoga comes in. That's where Yogananda comes in with the techniques that he gave the world. Because there is a science how we can interiorize our consciousness, our and take the searchlight of our senses that is normally directed to the world, reverse it, turn it inward, and become aware that we are not this body, that we are not this restless mind, but that we are the soul. And the soul is one with God. And that is true for all religions. Mm -hmm. They all teach that, mm -hmm. but only hidden, not open. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that the, perhaps one of the most important teachings was a path, a way to connect with the soul yeah. inside, with God yeah. inside. What would you say? Kriya Yoga is the main teaching. It's the main technique that Yogananda brought to the West. It was a technique that was hidden for many millenniums. It's a technique that Krishna taught, uh, the millenniums before Christ, and Christ taught a technique or something very similar to Kriya Yoga to his disciples. And it's a life force control. Uh, most men, a lot of meditation is mental. The problem with controlling the mind with the mind 
is that you need a lever. You can't, the mind is the problem. So if you control the energy, where the energy there is, there is the consciousness. And that's what Kriya Yoga is. So that's this unique technique that Yogananda brought. The second thing that he taught was to love God and to seek God. That gets lost in the shuffle sometimes because why are you meditating? You're meditating to love God. So love for God is a huge thing. And then non-attachment and even-mindedness are important keys that are brought over from the East. This, this idea of rising above the body. And then basic tenets of right behavior, the Ten Commandments. That's the foundation of any path, of any yogic path. Because if, you're, if your mind is restless, and if, you're, or if your emotions are restless, you can't control the mind. If, you're, if you don't have it together, you can't even sit down to meditate. Mm -hmm. So there has to be some stability there through right behavior, following the laws of life. And that's that. And this is all encapsulated in Patanjali's Eightfold Path of Yoga, which is very similar to the teachings of Yogananda, just adding this technique of, of Kriya Yoga to that. Mm -hmm. And the Kriya Yoga technique is basically a meditation. It's a meditation technique, yes, we do a meditation. So now that we have the opportunity, and because meditation is on one hand not necessarily very popular, associated with yoga, a lot of people finish their class, they do a little relaxation and go home, so this meditation is not necessarily part of it. On the other hand, a lot of people do just meditation and they do not do asana or complement it with uh, body work, work with the body. There's something very popular that people say, I, I'm a bad meditator because I can't stop my mind. <laughs> Tell me something about this. What, what <laughs> <laughs> That's a problem everybody has in the beginning. But that is where the teachings of Kriya Yoga come uh, into place because one of the techniques of Kriya Yoga is the so-called Hong So technique of concentration. That is a technique that helps us to really, over the time, focus our mind so that it is one-pointed. And that's actually the definition of meditation that Yogananda gave. Meditation is concentration on, uh, concentration used to know God. And so it all starts out with learning how to concentrate. And yes, it takes sometimes years of practice, but eventually everybody can learn it because it's based on a science. But does the mind stop? Yes, the mind actually stops. Because the thing is, there are always thoughts running around in our mind. And because of that, we have identified our self with the running thoughts. But when the thoughts have gone to rest, then what is there? There is still consciousness. Now we are looking at the consciousness of the soul. Now mm -hmm. we are looking at silence. Mm -hmm. Be still and know that I am God. That's exactly behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, you were associating the, the teachings of Yogananda with Patanjali's um, Eightfold uh, Path. Tell us a bit more about this. What, 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 why is it important to observe some behaviors uh, which, in fact, uh, the, the two first steps uh, in this Eightfold, the Yamas and Niyamas, are related to the speech and actions and thoughts that we have, but also how we relate with others. Why is this important? Well, again, like I was saying, but the, really the restlessness that comes with trying to control the mind, trying to watch the mind, which is what you're doing in meditation, is that emotional issues that we have create a deeper level of restlessness than even ordinary restlessness of the thoughts. There's a, there's a very, there's a troubled sense and it makes it really impossible to sit down and go within. And so again, unless we, we sort of get our life moderately harmonious, you don't have, no one has to be perfect, we're all flawed and there's the, the idea of sin, Yogananda was the first to throw that out. And he says, this is just basic science. If you, get, if you create a harmony in, in your, in, with others and in your own life, with your habits and your self-control and everything like that, then you're able to sit down and, so, and you're much more calmer to start it off. And that's, that's the basis. And then the second key after that, the third key is ashna, and that's where people stop. 
where you say it's hatha yoga, you know. But that's, that's the third rung on an eightfold path. The next is pranayama and pratyahara. In fact, even with ashna, really you only need to sit with a spine straight to meditate. You don't have to do all the, you know, the other ashna poses, although they're fantastic. And they can really, they actually do uh, provide a door to controlling life force as well. But we don't emphasize that because we want to go straight into meditation. You are uh, bringing up a lot of uh, associations between Yogananda's teachings and Christ's uh, teachings. And uh, while I personally believe, and in fact, uh, we had a guest here at the show very shortly ago, precisely analyzing how Jesus was a great yogi, um, a lot of people don't see it that way, and particularly Christians sometimes have a hard time accepting the knowledge of yoga. Sometimes they see it as part of Hinduism, and there's some conflict there. So I'm interested in your vision of this similarity of thoughts or teachings. Uh, how, how, how is it that Yogananda and Christ uh, were somehow teaching similar things? Or what are some of the core principles or practices that they shared? Christ, for example, said, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, and all thy strength. That is yoga. It's nothing else than that. Because how can you love something with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength? Unless you use some means how to direct and focus all your energy, all your thoughts, all your being towards God, towards... Uh, the supreme goal. So it's right there. Mm -hmm. The thing is, at Christ's time, when he walked the earth 2,000 years ago, the principles that are the basic of yoga, control of energy, those were not understood in those days because nobody knew what electricity was, what energy was. So he could only give his teach the teachings of yoga to the circle of his disciples. And if you look at St. John, the uh, book of Revelations, it's all there. He talks about the seven candlesticks. He talks about the uh, seven lights. Those are the centers in the chakra that Patanjali talks about. So it's all right there. But those teachings were not for the public. He gave those only to his close disciples because the time was simply not yet ripe. It's actually uh, interesting to see Babaji, who, re, uh, who gave back to the world the lost signs of Kriya Yoga. That happened in uh, 1860s, right when he and the West, the laws of electricity were defined. So both were simultaneously. Mm. It's a mm. very interesting coincidence. Mm. Well, and in fact, uh, while through the Gospels that we know, because they are included in the, New, in the New Testament, there are very few references to yoga, apparently there are other Gospels that have been discovered that are much more mm. uh, related to yoga. In fact, uh, describing some of these teachings in terms of energy work mm -hmm. uh, that he did with mm -hmm. his disciples. And Jesus said, if I hand offend thee, cut it off. If thy foot offend thee, cut that off. But, you know, that can't be literal. It's talking about this, the energy again. Mm -hmm. And the one, the one time he referenced the Old Testament, he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man lift it up. Again, the serpent being these, these energy, energetic patterns going up the spine, lifting up the energy in the spine. And then he follows that with, then who belie whoso believeth in him shall be you know, the Son of God or saved or whatever. And this idea of faith turns, it crystallizes into this sort of concept of belief which is, how do you believe something? And that's, that's all they're left with. The belief comes from realization, which comes from going inside and having that, that experience. So the belief comes more from an experience yeah. rather yeah. than from a phrase learned or, or a book read. In Hinduism, the word for belief means, also means visvas, without breath. When you're meditating and you're going deep, the breath actually stops. Mm -hmm. And that creates a state of faith or realization within you, and then you you understand, you experience the Christ consciousness, which again is a consciousness, not an individual. And, and it's, a, all, it's, all, you know, it's a universal term. 
So <clears throat> I see that you have no problem in acknowledging both Christ and Yogananda as teachers, as masters. Okay. Now it is common, especially in yoga, to hear masters or gurus say, I am the way. And if you want to get to God, you have to follow my way and not shop around. Just follow my way. Uh, this is a very common thing. And I always think, if, that, if, if Jesus was the only master, then how come other people could be enlightened before or after him? Or exactly Yogananda? It. So what do you think about this? That's exactly it. I mean, when Christ said, I'm the way, uh, he did not talk about the person of Jesus, but he was talking about the Christ consciousness that was inherent within him. And that Christ consciousness is in every single person on this earth. Only it is covered up. Covered up because our energy is constantly going outward, constantly directed to the world because that's where we are used to try to find fulfillment. That's where we are looking for happiness. We're looking outside of ourselves instead of looking inside. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's another aspect to that, which is, and it just kind of occurred to me, this might have been part of what Jesus was saying, because that's always bothered me, I am the way, you know, and we say that's Christ consciousness. Why did he say that? There's another reason that he is the way, just as Yogananda is the only way, as Moses is the only way, as Buddha is the only mm -hmm. way, is because when you follow a path, you have to follow it one pointedly. You can't mm -hmm. mix paths. Mm -hmm. and Joseph Campbell talked about this. He said that spiritual paths are like computer uh, programs, they have their own language. Mm -hmm. And if you mix stuff up, it kind of doesn't work. They don't translate well. They don't translate well. Yeah. So when you follow a path, you need to follow that particular path mm -hmm. as if that is your whole universe for you. Also, too, the, the, the dedication, the concentration, because again, uh, love the Lord like God the, with thy whole heart, mind, body, and soul. There, is this, there needs to be this total concentration. And that's actually, Yogananda said, uh, I'm just one of many, and I'm not the only one. The only claim that he makes is that the path of Kriya Yoga is the airplane uh, route to God. It's the fastest path it's because the of the scientific techniques. Uh -huh. But he never said you can't the find one. the only one. He never said that. Mm. So Well, good. <coughs> I'm glad. <coughs> Excuse me. And then, do you think this is one of the, the, th the, the reasons why modern yogis are not uh, so inclined to follow in a guru? Because we live in a culture that likes um, uh, going through different channels and trying different drinks and going to different activities. And so this idea of following one path and sticking to it and committing to it, you know, even some people like to have a PC and a Macintosh. They don't want to go just one way. They have two because... So, do you think this could be the but reason? But this is an age where people really need to, need to be efficient and to go fast and to, you know, instant gratification. And when you have a technique that can with, bring you in quickly, like prayer is an unscientific way to withdraw the consciousness. And Yogananda would always say, watching the breath is 24 times quicker than ordinary prayer, and Kriya Yoga is 24 times quicker than Hong Sa. So if you could do a few, Kriya, a few practices of Kriya and get the same result in much shorter length of time, this is really something for today's world that, that really doesn't have the time to spend hours and hours and hours in meditation, which some people think is necessary. This concludes the first part of a two-part show where I'm featuring Self-Realization Fellowship. My guests today were Brother Kalyanananda and Brahmachari Martin, longtime members of the Self-Realization Fellowship, the worldwide nonprofit spiritual organization founded by Paramahansa Yogananda. It has more than uh, 600 temples, retreats, ashrams, and meditation centers around the world, offering all interested seekers the opportunity to come together to experience the power of group meditation, focused retreat programs, inspirational services, and to share the spiritual fellowship. I hope you like our show today. And if you care to let me know, please shoot me an email at antonio at yogiviews.com. I hope to see you the next time.